Hi there. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are joining us from. Um, my name is Abhijit Bhadri. I'm the author of the book Dreamers and Unicorns. And in this uh, conversation today, uh, which is part of the weekly show that I do called Dreamers and Unicorns, I bring to you some of the smartest people that I know who are leading authorities in this field. And today I have exactly one such person who not only is a leading authority on the metaverse, which we will talk about, but you know what? I found that uh, she actually talks to some of these, uh, um, uh, you know, what would I call them? I mean, these are digital avatars and these are the people that she talks to. And you have to see this in order to believe it. Watch out for this one. Hi, Kathy. It's great to see you again. Given that you are a globally recognized futurist and have been dubbed the CEO's guide to the metaverse, what advice do you have for brands that want to enter the metaverse? Cookie, thank you so much. I'm so excited to get to talk to you. This is what I think my second or third time. Thanks for remembering me. Oh my goodness. Well, first of all, if you say I'm a futurist, then it is it is established I'm a futurist. Um, what I would say is that the metaverse um, is a very interesting place or places in that brands need to enter it very organically and they need to think about how can they meet the people that are already inhabiting these metaverses in a very organic way. Um, so, you know, whether it's gaming or music, try to find the right fit for the brand. So it'll be very exciting. Uh, interesting. Who do you think will be the Coco Chanel of the future? So I wholeheartedly believe this, Kuki, that the next Coco Chanel is probably a 10-year-old girl or a nine-year-old girl designing skins um, for avatars and Roblox or, you know, in other games. I really, really, truly believe that. And I see it with my children when they were able to create their own skins and um, they put as much importance in how they look in the virtual spaces in the metaverse as they do in, phys in the physical world. That's amazing. Is the metaverse a mindset or an actual place? That's a really good question. And um, I was very lucky to be able to work with uh, Neil Stevenson um, at Magic Leap. He was our futurist there. And he's the one that really came up with the term metaverse. Or I think he's the first one that coined the term. So he had really interesting views on it. I think it's both, Gookie. I think it's both a mindset in some ways, and it's both a place or places. So it'll be really exciting to see how people define the metaverse. Thanks for that. Who would you like to be dressed by in the metaverse? I would love to be dressed by a brand like Ralph Lauren, who I think is very, um, you know, it's it's a piece of Americana, but I think it's also, they're also quite, inter you know, quite fashion, uh, quite future thinking. So I'm really excited about that. Or maybe some up and coming designer uh, in the virtual space. Personally, I want to be dressed by a generative adversarial neural network trained on the archives of Coco Chanel. Talk about a new spin on an old classic. Cookie, I love the way you think. Hi, Kathy. It's so that is my friend Kathy. Uh, welcome, welcome to the show. Uh, so lovely to have you, Kathy. What was that? I mean, who were you talking to? <laughs> <laughs> Before we get to, that, to answer that question, Kathy, how would you describe yourself? Uh, Cookie AI really describes you only as a futurist, but uh, how do you describe yourself? <laughs> well, thanks for having me on the show. First of all, Ajit, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Um, so um, I am a tech futurist. Um, I have been, uh, I am a professionally trained futurist, I have to say that. Um, and I've been working, you know, over over 15 years in media and technology, the last six very, very focused on augmented reality, virtual reality, spatial computing and the metaverse. And, um, you know, worked with companies uh, like HTC Vive, Magic Leap, which many of you guys know or might have heard of at some point. Um, and then, you know, also Amazon Web Services. Now I'm kind of doing my own consulting um, and I wear several hats. Uh, I'm a, you know, I'm a VP at a, um, at a hologram studio. So creating holograms. Um, and yeah, I, and I, I do, I have, I wear many hats. I try to be, 
you know, involved in a lot of different interesting projects. Uh, but what I will say is just to frame that video, because people are like, what am I watching? Um, Kuki AI is one of the world's uh, most advanced conversational AIs. Um, she actually, I don't know if you ever, if you got a chance, but I know we're going to be talking about, about, about my book, but she actually gave us a testimonial for our book. So it's probably one of the first AIs to give a testimonial uh, for a book. <laughs> so um, that interview was doing crypto fashion week. Uh, I do a lot of work with luxury fashion brands and NFTs and, and, and digital fashion. Um, and she was interviewing me. I had interviewed her, interviewed her live on Clubhouse before. And um, it was this time. I, she I was in that particular Clubhouse session. Yes, I thought yeah. it was really fascinating. But she interviewed you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We turned the tables around, and she interviewed me. So, but it was yeah. quite amazing to think that this is what AI can do, conversational AI. I mean, that's truly fascinating. Mm -hmm. So, Kathy, delighted to have you. Uh, and you know, we've got a number of different people who have uh, you know joined in, and they are going to be asking uh, questions. But I, I really want to sort of get started by asking you uh, something that. Uh, you know, you're most well known for, and I would say that, uh, you know, which is what is the um, metaverse? What is the metaverse? And you recently went on uh, 60 minutes to answer that question. Is it amazing? What was it like? <laughs> uh, definitely a, like a lifelong, you know, achievement unlocked. You know, you want to be on 60 minutes for the right reasons. <laughs> Right. And Sorry. this is one of those situations where it was like uh, the right reasons um, they were doing. Uh, they were doing an episode on the future of the Internet and the metaverse. Um, and, yeah, I was one of the people that they featured. It was very exciting. I mean, working like seeing how they work, how 60 Minutes works. Um, it's a whole process. I mean, it took them about two hours to set up the cameras because they have a, a very specific style. Um, you know, anyone that's watched the show through the decades knows they have they have a very specific style. Um, and there, I would say one of the things that I was really impressed uh, with them is they do their homework. They verify everything. I mean, they would, they called me multiple times to verify things. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it was exciting, obviously, you know, very, very much one of those bucket list uh, kind of things. And, and it's, yeah, it's, it's unlocked a lot of opportunities for me, I, I would say so. And, and, you know, I'm sort of right now basking in reflected glory that, you know, I, it's not, it's never going to happen for me. But I can say I spoke to somebody and she was my guest who was on 60 Minutes. So it's reflected glory. So, Katie, I hope that's okay. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> uh, but I want to play for my, uh, you know, listeners this particular video clip. So, you know, which was, uh, I managed to get this from 60 All Minutes. The metaverse. And it's Here being it referred to uh, as the future of the internet. Watch. If the current version of the web is two-dimensional, think of the metaverse as three-dimensional. Um, Kathy Hackle is a... So, I'm sorry, the, the, the video clip is not playing, but I want to, uh, you know, come back and talk to you about how do you describe the metaverse? You know, is it uh, the fusion of digital and physical, is that, you know, when people say digital, is that what is the metaverse? It, it's How part it? of it. It's part of it. The way I try to explain to people is I take a little step back and I say, so Web 1.0, connected information. So we got the internet and all the good and the bad that came with that. Um, then Web 2.0, connected people. And we got social media, you know, and LinkedIn, for example, <laughs> and all the good and bad that came with social media. And then Web3 connects people, places, and things. And sometimes these people, places, and things, even the people, can be virtual or, you know, digital or virtual. I mean, there's debate on what the term is. Um, but it's not only, I think people tend to think metaverse and they think to, they, they tend to immediately go into Ready Player One, the Oasis. Um, you know, I don't think it needs to be that dystopian and it doesn't need to be solely in virtual reality. I think it's also, um, you know, I always think, what, why aren't they thinking of races and not Pokemon Go? So um, it's kind of this convergence of the physical and the digital. It is kind of where social media is heading. It is that future with wearables. Um, it is a convergence of technologies like AR, VR, IoT, um, cloud, edge computing, and everything else. Um, 
so it's it, it's kind of um, you know some people say it's the future of the internet. Um, it's the you know the next wave of computing. It's really a, a convergence. I mean, it's about shared virtual experiences and places. It has persistent content. Um, Kevin Kelly from Wired, who who wrote a fantastic cover story, you you read it, I know, um, called "The Mirror World." Uh, he says it's when the world becomes machine readable, and you well, know. Yeah, so I think that that is a very deep definition. Um, How far are we from that scenario where the entire world is machine readable? Yeah, uh, you know, within the next decade or two, it, we're starting to see glimpses of the metaverse. But in order to have that truly, fully readable world, we need massive types of infrastructure uh, and connectivity that we still don't, you know, we don't have. People are working to create them, right? But once you start to think about, you know, if we move away from our mobile phones into glasses, you're not talking about just, you know, 100 people with glasses. You're talking about millions or billions of people with connected devices on their faces. You know, you're going to need, you know, not even 5G. You're going to need 6G and beyond. You're going to need, you know, edge, really good edge, cloud. Like, There's just a lot of things from the infrastructure level that we still don't have. But but right now what you're seeing is glimpses of the metaverse. That's That's what I call it. So. So when you think about, uh, you know, uh, and I want to sort of really talk to you about um, this fabulous book you've written um, uh, called The Augmented Workforce. I, this morning, I actually did a small uh, sketch and put it in terms of, uh, you know, getting the audience familiar with it. But I really like the way you've talked about those six technologies um, that, you know, you kind of have the IoT uh, for, you know, all the devices which are connected, sending the information, artificial intelligence in the form of the apps that we are using constantly. And then, you know, the hard drive has now moved to the cloud, so you no longer need to save anything on a physical device. Uh, and then you have the blockchain, so that's four. What am I missing? Um, what are the... Yeah, extended reality. Extended well. reality, of course. Yeah, and which is kind of my forte. forte. <laughs> And uh, so you you said let's see IoT and cybersecurity and cybersecurity inside yeah yeah I That's always go here whenever 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 we're doing the list I always go here so IoT which you said artificial intelligence which you said the cloud blockchain extended reality and five G so there you go yeah yeah yeah, yeah. show me the cover of the book I really like that cover it's so future uh, futuristic looking yeah. Uh, guys, I have read this. I'm going to write a review on it uh, coming up in a day or two. Fabulous, fabulous book. Talks about so many examples. You know what I liked about the book was mm -hmm. that it gives you the information without it being intimidating. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for somebody like me who's not trained in this whole technology, I'm a novice. I like to read and pick up stuff. But then the way you explained it, I just thought it was so useful. It's very accessible, if that's mm -hmm. the word I have to use for it. Even though now that I know that Cookie wrote one of those endorsements, <laughs> you know, it's a little intimidating, but uh, no, I think it was really well done. Uh, how long did it take for you to write this? Yeah, so my co-author and I, you know, it took us about a year and 10 months. I think it would have taken us less, um, but we both had, you know, we both had started new jobs. We both moved uh, from two different cities. Um, you know, and then the pandemic hit. So, you know, some things had to be rewritten. Uh, so, so it took a little bit longer than we normally would have liked. Um, but it was an interesting, interesting process. And I love what you're saying that it's accessible. Like we created the book for it to be friendly, accessible, helpful. And I think it does accomplish that. It's not an intimidating read. It is a an informed read. I mean, there's it's jam packed with information. But it's for a bigger, broader audience that is interested in understanding, you know, what are these technologies? What do they mean for my business? What do they mean for work, for my workforce, for me as a worker? Um, so, so yeah, it's it's a lot of that. And um, and the cover, I'll tell you, uh, you know, something really interesting. So the cover is actually, if you go to um, if you go to Instagram or Facebook, it's augmented. The cover is actually augmented, and we've got filters. It's it's wow. a beautiful augmentation. Um, and yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. The, the cover's actually an an ode uh, to Wired magazine. So we, oh, yeah, uh, one of the finest magazines uh, about technology mm -hmm. and looking at the future. Yeah, yes, absolutely. 
and Kevin Kelly is, of course, everyone's hero, uh, especially mine. I mean, you know, yeah. I really think that the way he's just sort of made technology easy to understand and yet had a fairly deep discussion about technology at the same time. Great skill in writing. So, plus, I love his uh, photographs that he publishes periodically on Twitter. I just love his photographs. Mm -hmm. um, back to your book, um, uh, you know, Kathy, you talk about different uh, kinds of technology and i just want to first get an overview of the six why you think each one of them sort of is going to change give me an example from different sectors to tell me how it will change uh, so you know let's just start with iot i mean uh, so the internet of things iot what does it really uh, do i mean it gathers information is that what it does it gathers information, it collects data, it com has devices communicating with devices. And I think that that's one of the critical parts of the metaverse, right? Um, I almost see the metaverse as kind of where we meet the machine. Um, because, you know, you've got, let's say, autonomous vehicles or, you know, or devices operating in the world. Um, and they're seeing, you know, they're seeing in their own way, right? Um, they're seeing data in ones and zeros. But once we have, you know, potentially glasses, we're going to be able to see that data not in ones and zeros because that's not necessarily how we interpret things, but we'll see it in, you know, in 3D assets and in different forms. Uh, so it's some way kind of where we're going to meet, uh, we're going to meet, you know, the machine, humans, machines are going to meet in that and kind of see the, the navigate the world together in some ways. Um, so definitely IoT, I mean, AI uh, with artificial intelligence. Um, I, I'm very focused on thinking of AI from a human centered perspective. Because uh, I think a lot of the conversation with AI tends to be very, you know, tends to be abstract in some ways. Um, but I, I, you know, in my time at Magic Leap, we we had a virtual human called Micah, and um, and she was kind of a human centered way of presenting AI. She was non threatening. Um, basically, people would put that. So I've got the the you know the glasses back here. I can't point, but right there, right there. Um, mm -hmm. And people would put the headset on and in front of them would be this virtual human, Micah. Micah wouldn't speak. It was more kind of at that point, uh, she didn't speak, but you would kind of ha engage with her. Um, and when she would smile, you would smile back, even though she's virtual, you would work on a collage with her. And it was kind of this very human centered approach um, to artificial intelligence that I think sometimes is lacking, um, you know, in, 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 if we really think about the long term and how we can engage with AI. Um, that's why, you know, Pandora Bot's uh, Kuki AI, I think, is so powerful. Um, and she's changed. Like, what you saw in that video, she's actually changed a lot because um, they're using metahumans from Unreal Engine. So she looks very different. And she's got a, a an account in TikTok that is blowing up. Um, so, yeah, it's it's crazy. <laughs> and and I just, you know, what I found very interesting is, uh, you know, Kuki AI, and I'm sort of drawing on the conversation that you had with her on uh, uh, on Clubhouse, as well as this one, you know, when you look at it, I, it's uh, uh, this one in, in Clubhouse, you had to actually call out her name and sort of say, yep. Cookie, you'll sort of do this. Now, this time I didn't see you doing that. So that's a little uh, improvement in some ways. But I also find that the responses are really, um, I mean, they are not like, you know, it's a, uh, it's not like somebody pulling up something from the internet and uh, a mm -hmm. quote which is there. It's not like a massive set of responses. It just seems very tailored to what you are asking. So um, I, I was really impressed to see how much has changed in such a short mm -hmm. time. You know, yeah. that's quite uh, impressive. So um, when you think about, uh, you know, extended reality, which is where I want to spend a lot of time with you, mm -hmm. um, when you look at that, what does it mean for brands? Uh, you know, you, you are working with various brands. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you see happening? What functions will change? Well, I think extended reality becomes the way we see the future, right? It becomes that next, the screenless screen in some ways becomes, you know, the, the monitor <laughs> in some ways, but not, you know, it's, it's not flat. Um, but it's it, it's kind of how we'll see that, that content, you know, that information in front of us and, um, it has profound effect. Uh, you know, I, I'm very lucky that I, I, I get to live, you know, in Washington, D.C., right outside Washington, D.C. So I'm very lucky and I, I get to actually go to Capitol Hill um, and talk to lawmakers and put them through, you know, demos and, and talk about the technology. 
And I think it's important to inform lawmakers in the United States and everywhere in the world about what what extended reality is, because it's going to change the way everyone, you know, citizens are going to engage with the physical world. Um, so there's a lot of emphasis on artificial intelligence, and, and rightfully so. Um, but I think that extended reality is, as a technology will have a bigger impact in how you and I and citizens across the world, whichever country, engage with the physical world, right? If, if the mobile phone changed how we engage with each other and with information, with governments, et cetera, then, you know, taking that step further with extended reality and eventually, you know, glasses, that's going to have a very, very big, big impact as well. But Google Glasses was a failure. So what makes you think that, uh, you know, glasses will be the next big uh, format in which we are going to engage with people, et cetera? Um, what makes you say that? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think Google Glass was ahead of its time. Um, and, you know, it wasn't, it, 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 you know, this is the thing. It, it was a failure, but it's still being used. They have an enterprise program. You know, uh, the Shanghai Airport in Singapore, for example, uses it for logistics. So there are there are uses and there are implementations. Um, you know, it, what makes me think that it's going to happen? Um, I mean, the signals of the large investments uh, from every single of the big single one of the big tech companies. They're investing billions, if not millions, of dollars. Uh, you know, you have Tim Cook um, saying multiple times that augmented reality is a very important part of the future of Apple. Um, you know, have Mark Zuckerberg talking about that. W one of the things that he wants to um, do in his life is create these glasses, you know. So these are people with, you know, not not infinite capital, but almost, right? Um, so, you know, if they're making those investments, it sounds quite interesting. And anyone at Microsoft as well, if you ask them, they're going to talk about the future of mixed reality. And that's the term they use. Um, you know, here in the United States, you also have the U.S. government investing $21 billion with a B, um, you know, in, in, in what's, what they call IVIS, which is a, a Microsoft HoloLens that is created for, uh, for the Army. So, you know, those are significant numbers in my point of view. Uh, we've got a question coming up from uh, one of the listeners. It says that, uh, what are your thoughts around making AI for everyone, or will it be something which will remain an asset of the giant uh, uh, tech companies or data banks, as this person says? So is it going to become accessible to people, and what kind of time frame are we talking about in that case? Yeah, and that's a great question, Uma. What, what I will say is I believe in everyone owning their own AI. Um, you know, of course, there will be, you know, people will use, you know, banks and corporations will use the data. You know, unfortunately, that's Sadly, that's how, how some things are. Um, but, you know, I look at, for example, at the AI Foundation that does, um, they worked on uh, digital Deepak, so like a virtual copy of the Deepak Chopra. They're working with a lot of folks to create their, their AI versions. Um, and their whole concept is that you should be able to own your own AI and know what your AI is doing, um, you know, and have full control over training your, your AI. So um, I do believe in, in, the, you know, in the future, of people owning their their artificial intelligence so when you say owning your artificial intelligence what does it mean does it mean that i'm going to own my own hologram version or digital version is that what it is it's a bit like saying that i own the profile that i have on linkedin is, yeah is, it, is that it, a, it's something like that it's like when you eventually you know a lot of people are starting to like deepak chopra for example created a virtual deepak because he only has certain hours in the day and there's only so many people he can help himself, right? Uh, but with Deepak Chopra, with his virtual Deepak, he can kind of do that in a lot bigger uh, for a lot, you know, he can scale himself a, a lot faster, um, you know, you know, changing himself into a virtual form. It's not perfect, but it's great. You can actually use him in an app right now. Um, and he talks to you and he meditates with you and he does a lot of stuff. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So it's really, it's, you know, you know, it's not necessarily him, but it's something it's, it's in, it's in his likeness. He's trained it with his own thinking and his own words. And, you know, so, and he knows, you know, he keeps tabs on what his, you know, his virtual Deepak is doing and uh, not yours specifically, but in general. So, yeah, I think the AI foundation has that premise of you creating your own artificial, like your own kooky, not, I mean, not necessarily kooky, but your own, you know, let's say your own uh, AI version of Uma. Uh, and being able to own that because it is your likeness and be able to train it and know what your, you know, virtual Uma is doing, for example. 
So what does it do for things like citizenship? Because, you know, mm -hmm. when you create something like that, I mean, you know, uh, uh, what kind of nationality would that have or would it not have nationality? Would it be boundaryless? What is your take on that? Well, I think the world is changing. You know, when you talk about blockchain, you talk about decentralization, um, and you talk about digital currencies, you talk even if you get a little bit further down the blockchain world, um, there's decentralized autonomous organizations, which pretty much people coming together around a specific interest. So, you know, I wrote an article for Forbes about that and started to think about what is the impact? You know, how does this impact a corporation? How does this impact the country, right? Um, so I think it, it, you know, I don't want to make any predictions uh, as to what it means for the future of governments, because in reality, I don't know. I have potential ideas of second and third order effects that could happen. Um, but, you know, it, it does feel like people are joining together, depending on, you know, mostly around interests. Um, and it, that could be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so uh, here's a question from uh, Nidhi Das, who says, can your virtual AI or uh, bot work with your kids when you return back to the offices? You've got three kids. What, what, you know, do you, are you using any of that tech for your kids? Um, well, I wish my virtual AI could do homework with them. Um, but no, you know, Alexa already helps. Uh, <laughs> um, I actually use a presentation of, uh, of a picture I took. I was out, you know, a friend of mine was out shopping and took the picture and sent it to me. And then I screenshot it. Um, it was a picture of these um, like uh, towels for the kitchen. And one says, Alexa, pour me some wine. And the other one's Alexa, watch the kids. Um, <laughs> and I'm sorry if I woke her up by saying her name. Um, but yeah, you know, <clears throat> uh, in the future, potentially, I mean, I don't know if my AI would do that. I, I, I would use my, my artificial intelligence, my virtual Kathy, more so to do more speaking engagements, to you know promote the book, to be in many places at once. I don't know if I would use it with my kids. Maybe if I'm you know <laughs> if I'm losing my marbles and I need I need her to step in. Um, but yeah, yeah, um, I I kind of quite see that that it's possible that you know there would be no concept of sick days because you know uh, my my virtual person can go ahead and attend all the meetings and do all the talking or whatever uh, needs to you know, depending on the nature of work that you're doing. Now, I have another question coming up from uh, Ashish, uh, and his question really says that, uh, uh, can one robot or AI take the interview of another robot and have engaging conversations without human interventions? Um, yeah, actually, it was really interesting. Kuki, I think it was on Twitch. Uh, she would have these, battle, these bot battles, um, and she would, yeah, she would talk, you know, it was kind of like, pitting one bot against the other bot to try to see who was more advanced. Um, yeah, I think it was on Twitch. So definitely check that out. All right. Uh, uh, Kathy, back to, uh, you know, the book that you've mm -hmm. done. And I really recommend people read that. Uh, and I'm going to sort of, of course, uh, you can make out that I was completely bowled over by the book mm -hmm. in terms of all the examples that you've given. Uh, I want to talk about two specific areas right now. Uh, you know, one I thought was very fascinating how um, all these technologies come together when it comes to hiring people. And we are uh, sort of looking at a very interesting time in our uh, uh, lives where people, because of the pandemic, for whatever it has done to us, so many people are really rethinking their careers mm -hmm. and career transitions and talking about, you know, what they should be doing. So there is, on one hand, you have many unfilled vacancies. Yeah. On the other hand, you also have people who are out of jobs and then you have the scenario where you are looking at um, using technology to change the way recruitment happens. Um, so it, all of it, you know, connect the dots for me and tell me what does it really mean? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things we're seeing two things, right? A, a labor shortage uh, in some ways, because some people just don't want to do certain jobs. They don't believe, you know, that they need to risk their lives necessarily or or do something that just isn't, un isn't fulfilling. Right. So there's that happening. So what I would say to those people that have those opportunities that are able to step back and and just not do the job is that there are amazing opportunities in this future of the Internet. Right. Um, you know, in that Kevin Kelly story that he wrote, he talks about, you know, the next billionaires will be made out of this future, out of this, you know, in Metaverse Web 3.0. So there's lots of opportunities to innovate in that Web 3 world. Uh, what I would say also as well, that when we wrote the book, 
you know, we're not naive. We know that automation does replace workers. We just don't think that it's going to be, you know, people tend to have the headline of like, all robots are going to take all jobs or, you know, 70% of jobs will be done by robots. We don't believe in technology necessarily being something that replaces the worker. It will in some cases, but we see technology as something that can augment the worker or complement the worker um, to being able to put on, you know, one of these devices and be able to get upskilled faster uh, or be able to do a job you weren't able to do before. Um, so I think that there's just a lot of opportunities that these technologies will bring to the workforce. And we're heading into that augmented workforce where, you know, you might be augmenting yourself as a worker with, you know, with technology, you might be working next to a robot as well. It's just kind of this augmented workforce that we're going into. I, I, I totally, uh, you know, I also have a similar kind of a point of view that, uh, when you look at some of the technology which has become invisible, I mean, we don't yeah. think twice about using a calculator when you give me a complex math problem. I mean, so, you know, technology in various shapes and forms. You know, today when we think of technology, we don't necessarily think of calculator as a technology or, you know, whatever. Uh, vehicles make us uh, go to someplace faster, etc. Yeah. But I also think that when you think about, um, you know, the, the, uh, the way hiring gets done today, do you think that it will replace the way uh, uh, you know humans have been normally finding matches for jobs and people. Do you think that will change drastically? What is your view? Um, I, you know, I, I think it needs to change and evolve. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that I've been reading about. You know, a artificial intelligence actually choosing who to fire. <laughs> You know, uh -huh. things like that, that, that's not very human centered, right? That's not a very human centered approach to the use of the technology. Uh, you know, they, it fits, uh, you know, a percentage that companies think they need to meet or something like that. So I, I think that needs to change. I also think that a more human centered approach, uh, you know, if you had, you know, if instead of that, you know, an email, you actually got to ask questions to a virtual being that's a recruiter or, or you know, a sort of AI recruiter that can answer some questions. Uh, that could be helpful. That could feel you make you feel at least a little bit more heard. Um, so I do think that there are ways to use the technology in that way. Yeah, I mean, I sort of think that uh, uh, what I see happening in many of the companies which are using conversational AI, for example, mm -hmm. you know, it's being used not only to give information. So, you know, if I say that, you know, when is this job expected to open up or, you know, how many people are being considered, whatever, right, information. Or I say that, you know, I've heard that this company wants to do uh, open up another factory in so and so place. Is that true or not? I mean, so there are lots of preliminary questions that the bots can answer, which is today already being done. But I also see the opportunity that, uh, you know, the bots can find a better fit. Um, you're potentially through the conversation and the questions that I ask. You can assess my, you know, verbal communication. You can assess my proficiency you know, using AI, uh, augmented reality, beg your pardon, you can possibly see how smoothly I can do something and sort of judge proficiency. So there are multiple ways in which it can be used. So mm -hmm. yes, I agree that I think this is an opportunity for uh, people to really rethink the hiring process, possibly remove some of the biases that humans have, uh, you know, so it's that. Um, to the other question that uh, you've explored in the book, which is about how uh, learning and development is going to change, you know, and mm -hmm. mixed uh, reality has a huge amount of um, influence in this particular space. Talk to me about how learning and development is going to be done differently. Well, I think there's an opportunity with, you know, with these technologies to, like I said, upskill and retrain workers a lot faster. Um, there's a, you know, when people train in VR, they retain information more. Um, you know, I, I personally was very lucky because I was a, one of the VR experts that UPS, the, you know, delivery and logistics company um, worked with, um, you know, I, I advised them when, prior to the launch of their VR driver training program back in 2017. That's such a long time ago. Um, they've been training some of their drivers, um, you know, the, the delivery drivers, also their truck drivers using virtual reality. They've seen great results. Um, because at the end of the day, it's about being able to train someone uh, in a low risk setting uh, for potentially, you know, to make to make it safer, make it safer for the driver, make it safer for the community. Um, you know, obviously, that means that, you know, if the packages are delivered in time and there's no accidents, that means, you know, 
more optimization and better processes for the company and equals, you know, probably an impact on the bottom line. Um, so, so, you know, I think it's powerful, you know, from an education perspective, you know, if I'm getting an operation and, you know, I hope that uh, the surgeon that does the operation has had, you know, many, many opportunities to practice the procedure. So with VR, you know, they can practice on a digital corpse hundred times before they actually get to the corpse and then to the real human. So there's, there's just a lot of different opportunities there to learn, um, you know, and even if you think about access, you know, being able to, you know, put a VR headset and go into a, you know, a class with one of the best, you know, best, you know, teachers in the world. I always joke about, it would be great to have Mary Curie teach my daughter uh, chemistry, right? Um, obviously <laughs> she's no longer with us, a long time gone, um, but you know, <laughs> but you know, there's nothing. You know, we she could be recreated, and and she could teach chemistry in in a uh, in an extended reality setting. Setting. Uh, you know, uh, do you think schools will adopt uh, uh, this mixed reality uh, technology faster than um, learning and development teams and organizations, or would it be the other way around? I think learning and development teams are are adopting it very quickly. You know, the pandemic ha pushed that pushed that a lot further because they couldn't have people in for classes and stuff. They could just, you know, do the training and ship it in a VR headset or put it in web uh, in WebXR on their computers. Um, so I definitely think you know that there's something there. So uh, when you think about uh, uh, you know how dependent is all of this in let's say. Uh, you know, a 5G kind of world because we've not yet gone there. But yeah, it's already coming into many places already. You know, there's hardware which is 5G compliant. But uh, where do you see that uh, changing the speed? What What is that going to do with um, all the stuff that we are using, devices and opportunities? Yeah, I think it's, you know, obviously 5G is about connectivity, lower latency, those sorts of things. Um, I'm really interested in in how the telcos are using, you know, f extended reality to prove the use cases for 5G, right? What is this really good at? Is it great for being able to do hologram calls, uh, for example? What is it, you know, those sorts of things I think I find really interesting. Uh, and yeah, I mean, 5G changes, you know, if you can do your, if you can get access to information faster than you already do, that is power, right? That is very helpful. Uh, we already have all the information at our fingertips within seconds, but if you speed that up and you have actually more information than you can have, that you can, you know, um, have in, have in, in, in your fingertips, then that's even better. And that's going to make all of us even more impatient, you know, today. <laughs> or well, smarter, smarter in some way. <laughs> yeah, at any given point of time, you kind of say, oh, gosh, why is it taking four seconds to do, you know, something? Yeah, um, with you. Um, I want to switch gears and sort of uh, uh, talk to people about, um, you know, some of the things that when you are looking at, you talked about your, you being a trained futurist. Mm -hmm. What does that really mean? You know, uh, how are futurists trained? Where did you get trained? Talk to me about that. Yeah. So there's a discipline called strategic foresight. Um, and it, you know, there is a whole academic discipline around it. It's been taught in, you know, for example, I went to the University of Houston to get trained. I've also done a lot of the other different courses. Um, but, uh, you know, I went and got trained at the University of Houston. University of Houston has been teaching strategic foresight for, I think, over 30 years. Um, there's frameworks. Um, th there's lots of different things, you know, it's a discipline, it, just like you have historians that study the past, uh, there is a discipline called strategic foresight that tries to make sense of the future. They don't, we don't make predictions. It's more like we look at the potential, the signals and the trends, try to make sense of them. Think about second and third order effects. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a really interesting field. It's a field that I think is having kind of a resurgence after the pandemic when people, you know, people didn't ask what if. Uh, a lot of corporations knew, you know, when people say, oh, this is a black swan event, it was not, um, you know, people knew, you know, there was that, you know, the, the Bill Gates talk, there's lots of signals that were like, oh, a potential pandemic could happen. Um, but, you know, very few companies were prepared for what did that mean if a pandemic happened? So asking what if um, has become something incredibly important for the future of business, not only thinking about the next quarter, but the next quarter century. What does that mean? You know, how does your business change? What should you prepare, be preparing for? What is your preferred future um, as well? So, so, yeah, I mean, there's a whole discipline, uh, academic discipline behind strategic foresight. 
So, um, Kathy, uh, talk to me about something which has already happened so we know how you sort of thought it through. Talk to me about a, a little trend that you saw and then how it translates into a second and third mm -hmm. order uh, shift. Walk me through one of the examples. Yeah. So one example, and, and this is one a lot of, uh, of futurists like myself have used, is thinking through autonomous vehicles, right? Obviously, people think autonomous vehicles, there's more safety, uh, not as many accidents. Um, what are the, some second and third order effects? Well, that carbon donation is going to go away. Oh yeah, exactly. That's where I was going to go. So there's two two things that you know that you can look at in the United States. A lot of the organ donation comes from people, um, you know, being killed or you know in, in in car accidents. So what happens with organ donation, right? That gets reduced because you you won't have you know that part. But so what does that do, you know, to you know the the people that are creating these lab grown organs, etc. Another another impact there is also, for example, in cities like New York. Are there cities like parking, some of those parking tickets and parking prices and tolls and all that stuff um, that helps pay for roads and infrastructure, right? So if you have autonomous vehicles that, you know, just pick you up and drop you off, you don't know them, own them, they don't have to park. Um, what does that do, you know, in, in, you know, autonomous vehicles that don't illegally park because they know they can't park there. Uh, so what does that, you know, what does that do to infrastructure? And, and the fact that, you know, today you have almost eight parking slots for each car mm -hmm. in the U.S. Uh, so, you know, what happens to all that real estate? What happens to uh, real estate prices? What happens yeah. to the shopping malls, which have some of these? So I can sort of see that. Okay, that's, yeah. that's pretty interesting. Uh, if you were to take the same thing from the point of view of work, let's take... Uh, you know, one of the uh, one of the uh, triggers, let's say digital currency, when you sort of really look at that, is there something that should tell me that um, a particular kind of a trend or whatever is happening is going to go uh, uh, go big and scale up? Uh, or is there uh, no way to predict that? Because, you know, you can just see some digital currency is one such example, mm -hmm. many digital formats. Um, does it mean that you know we will stop using paper currency, or will it exist in parallel, um, or would you sort of say that in the next thirty years it will be entirely digital because concept of commerce would have changed electronically? I mean, it, when I think about all of that, even from a country like India, I mean, I see tremendous amount of shifts that have happened in the last mm -hmm. uh, two years. You know, when I think about it. Today, you can go down uh, to a hawker who's sort of ferrying stuff on the roadside. You can pay with a digital wallet. I mean, just about mm -hmm. everyone accepts mobile payments. So yeah. uh, do you think cash is disappearing? I don't know if it's disappearing. I mean, it, it, I don't use it personally. Like someone asked me for cash. I don't have any. Like um, everything I use is, you know, digitally in my bank and, and everywhere. Uh, so the, the idea of fiat currency, I mean... I still, I think it still remains, but I think you'll see a lot more with digital currency. Um, you know, and I, I can't remember where I read the statistic, but it said that four out of five um, millennials, I think it is, or Gen Z, uh, I need to find the statistic, uh, think that cryptocurrency in some form uh, will be part of the retirement, um, you know. So, you know, you've got many things, many ways, many things that you prepare for retirement, right? Um, and it looks like cryptocurrency will potentially be one of those. So, um so yeah, it'll be it'll be quite quite interesting. Um, uh, when you think about uh, uh, you know, the effect of a number of these these six technologies that you've uh, sort of talked about, you know, IoT, cloud, etc., what we spoke about, what do you think it is going to do to careers of people? You know, will people um, certainly today you see people changing jobs a lot more frequently. People are making sort of not just changing in adjacent areas, you know, so. Um, they are actually working in completely different areas as well. What do you think is going to happen to careers? What's your take on that? So I think there's a, a statistic that says that uh, children born today, 50% um, of children born today will live to about 113. Um, so that's a really long time to live, right, if you think about it. And that that changes the idea and the concept of career and job, right? Um, my, you know, my parents, potentially your parents also – you probably had one job that they had for a very, very long time. And that was the normal standard. Nowadays, you know, I've pivoted careers two times already. Um, so, so, you know, uh, when I think about my children, it's like, they're going to have the idea of career is going to change. 
and they're going to, you know, they're going to change. They're going to have multiple careers. If they're going to live that long, uh, you know, they're probably not going to retire at 65. <laughs> That's like a halfway point. Um, so, so yeah, I think that they're going to, it's going to shift and change and, and they're going to work differently. So uh, when you look at that, I mean, it sort of um, puts an enormous amount of strain on uh, concepts like social security, et cetera, which some countries have. Mm -hmm. And already, you know, some of that infrastructure is creaking. So uh, do you anticipate that governments are going to do away with that? Do you think the governments are going to pull together and make it uh, accessible for everyone? Or do you think uh, medical technology would have grown so much that we will have healthier people with gene editing, et cetera, all of that? Um, I mean, it really depends. I, I don't know if social security will be gone away. I mean, it'll be strained um, with younger generations as, you know, as we get older. Um, I do see, you know, for example, companies um, like several companies that work with synthetic humanoid robots um, that are working to kind of alleviate that. And, you know, when there's a lack of human workers to be able to do some things, they might bring in those humanoid robots to be able to help the elderly, for example. Um, so I think it'll, you know, I don't know if I don't know if social security will go away 100 percent. Um, but it probably won't be able to be to benefit as many people as it already does. And um, yeah. Um, uh, you know, we are just in the last 15 minutes of our uh, conversation. I want to sort of learn from you about how you spend your time. What are your reading habits? How do you keep yourself updated? Uh, talk to me about, uh, you know, let's start with what's your method of gathering information? You know, so I'm a, yeah, I'm a I'm a voracious um, I'm a voracious consumer of information, probably like you are. Um, so I, you know, I there's several things that I use. I use Feedly, for example, to kind of curate some of the things I'm seeing. I use Digo D I I G O to do collections of different signals and trends to be able to kind of go back to them and highlight things. Um, you know, I, I I actually create something called called the Metaverse Weekly for Forbes. Um, which is kind of a list of things that happen in the metaverse, mostly related to brands. Um, and I put that out on a weekly basis. So that means a lot of reading, a lot of trying to find these stories, um, collecting them, et cetera. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, I almost feel like um, when I start my day, you know, a day trader, like some of the trades, shares and stocks uh, normally starts the day and like with tons of screens, looking at what all the shares are doing when, when the market opens, et cetera. Um, for me, it's like, I don't do that, but I scan the horizon. I scan kind of like the news, not just news from the U S but news from other places, news about the environment, news about economics, news about climate, news about this and that, not just technology, even though that's kind of where I spend most of my time, but trying to look at the broader, um, the broader kind of view. And, and once you've read something, I mean, what's your method of uh, uh, culling out information? Do you uh, take notes? Do you sort of uh, put it all together? Um, hmm. Talk to me. Yeah, I mean, hmm. I mean, it's all virtual, like digital notes, right? You know, Digo, Digo allows you to kind of highlight parts of the article and do collections. So that's been very useful. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I take notes, physical notes on them. It's more like, you know, maybe I'll start a Google Doc and start populating things there or add interesting links. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of have an ongoing Google Doc with different sources for different topics. Um, and it's kind of like lived on for many years. So like, I'll find a lot of stuff there. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it, I don't know. Like, I don't use post it I know some people use post-its in books or things like that. And mine is more a lot more digital in that sense. Um, so yeah, it's, I would say Digo, Feedly, uh, Google Docs, and, you know, and I do have my, you know, my assistant who's, who's wonderful at being able to kind of organize things for me as well. And uh, what, what skills would, uh, you know, somebody has asked, Gitanjali has asked this question that, uh, uh, what, what are some of the skills that uh, will, we should be building, you know, when you look at the future, what is your take on that? I mean, where do you see that moving? What skills will become more important? Resiliency. I think, you know, if anything, if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's resilience. I think that's going to be important. Uh, flexibility. We need to be flexible. Uh, creativity is more important now than ever, right? Um, I think that's going to be one of the things that's going to be unleashed in the metaverse is creativity. And um, yeah, I even call it futures intelligence, right? So we're going to need, uh, leaders are going to need emotional intelligence to lead, but they're also need to be intelligent about the future and better understand, you know, 
try to, you know, once again, not think about just the next quarter, but the next quarter century. So I think that, you know, the idea of futures intelligence will be very important as well. Why is it so hard to extend the time horizon? You know, because I can mm -hmm. think of uh, uh, what's going to happen in this quarter, you know, but it's that much tougher for me to sit back and really say, okay, how will things change in 25 years? Because, you know, so much changes in six months. You know, Cookie could do something, uh, you know, a couple of weeks earlier and now, uh, you know, th there's, a, there's a shift. So in that, how do you think about 25 years uh, in that yeah. kind of scenario? I think that it's it's because futures thinking is a muscle that people need to practice. In thinking about the future is innately human. Um, there's been studies done that show that some birds and some apes can do like a near future kind of thinking, but that only humans can actually do long term uh, futures thinking. They can only think, you know, we're the only species that can really think long term. But it's something that you need to practice, right? It's 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 something that needs to be trained. That needs to be kind of um, you know, kind of. Um, I don't know what nurtured in some ways. So, so, you know, it's kind of like this futures thinking, I always say future thinking about the future is a muscle that you need to kind of train. So, um, and I do, I, Ajit, I do have to kind of jump off a couple minutes early if that's okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know that uh, you have a couple of things going on, but mm -hmm. that was really the last question that I had. And I just want to say, uh, thank you. Is there a particular, um, idea why, which struck you while writing the book that you'd like to share with the listeners? Uh, is that something, uh, you know, anything that changed for you in the process of writing? I think the biggest challenge was writing a non, like a nonfiction book that you're trying to write to stay as evergreen as possible of technologies that are changing by the day. That's a challenge. That was a challenge. That was one of the biggest challenges, I think. Um, you know, because we don't want the book to be outdated in six months. We wanted to, you know, live on. Um, so we try to do our best to keep it as evergreen as possible. Um, you know, I think it's going to be one of those books that we're going to have to keep updating. <laughs> um, so I think that was the biggest thing that struck me. It's like writing ever, an evergreen nonfiction book about technology is very hard to do. Oh, absolutely. And thank you so very much. I so appreciate your coming and joining and talking to us. Good luck with all your books and wish you all the very best. And may you have a clearer view of the future than anybody else. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.